Hey everybody, I want to introduce you to Pastor James Foster. He is the pastor of Living Truth of Christ Church here in Lafayette. He got it started a number of years ago. He's the founding pastor and he's still the pastor, which is a testament to uh, the family of that church, still appreciating his ministry. Uh, they've had a lot of great things that have happened in the last number of years, but one of the things that I've seen from their church is that they're a church that is willing to step out in faith and trust God when they sense that he is leading. And so um, I've asked James to join us to talk about what it means to put God first in his life as a pastor and in the life of his church and in all of our lives. And so uh, James, let's start by, sure. um, tell us just a little bit about yourself first of all, just the brief synopsis, uh, how long you've been in ministry, what's your family situation like, introduce yourself a little bit, and then uh, we'll get into some questions for sure you. Sure thing, sure thing. James Foster, and I'm married to uh, my wife. <clears throat> We've been married about uh, 40, 46, seven years. It'll be 47 years this year. And we have four daughters, all girls, and uh, the girls uh, flipped the script, and now we have four grandsons. <laughs> so <laughs> enjoying the four grandsons. I uh, grew up, both of us grew up in Gary, uh, came down to Lafayette uh, as an undergrad at Purdue University. After graduating from Purdue, I uh, decided to work for Purdue. So I worked at Purdue Calumet for a couple of years. I came down to the main campus after that and uh, became an administrator for the residence halls and uh, learned uh, quite a bit of, quite a few things as an administrator residence halls there, uh, nearly 40 years. Uh, in the meantime, God calls me to, uh, to uh, preach the gospel. And I'm thinking that he wants me to begin to leave Purdue and be a full-time pastor somewhere. And I prayed about it, and I just sensed that God was saying, no, that's not what he had in mind. So I hung on to the Purdue job, accepted uh, the training, went to some seminary, uh, uh, seminary extensions, and uh, began to learn some things about being a preacher of the gospel. And God used me to uh, be a preacher of the gospel for a couple of churches in town here before I was called a pastor. And so I've been pastoring since uh, the year 2000. And God has blessed me to, uh, uh, to continue. In fact, I pastored uh, a couple of churches before 2000. I, 2000 was the most recent pastorship. I uh, pastored since uh, 1980. And and uh, got the experience there. But one key thing for me, Jeff, is God got my attention when I was 13 years old and uh. I was made the uh, assistant superintendent of Sunday school. And so <laughs> he, he had me studying his word since then. And so although I was working uh, that secular job at Purdue, uh, I just had gotten accustomed to being in God's word uh, steps of the way there. As You've well. always been engaged in some form of ministry since a long time ago. Long time. We won't ago. talk about numbers of years, but <laughs> okay. uh, it's been it's been a while. Now you've been in our church before on a Sunday morning. You've preached in our church before on a Sunday morning. Yes. Uh, you've had your band here, and there have been uh, times when I have taught at your church, and you know as well as anybody else that there's a significant difference significant in difference. the way our two churches operate, and in fact, the way the 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 cultural expression of black churches versus traditionally culturally white churches have expressed themselves. So how about let's start off by you sharing with me and with our congregation, what does the word worship mean in your context? Uh, what is, and, it, and you can go ahead and talk about some of the differences if you see some of those differences, but in the context of your congregation and, um, and your experience, what, is, what does worship really mean? Uh, the first thought that comes to my mind when I think about what worship means in our culture, in our church, is uh, celebration, celebration of God. We celebrate God. And then I think of tradition because traditionally, I look back on the churches that I've uh, participated in, even as a youth and so forth. And traditionally, uh, we've celebrated God because our ancestors celebrated uh, deliverance from slavery. And so it just kind of connects with that in terms of, boy, who wouldn't celebrate a God who can get people out of slavery sort of a thing? And so uh, kind of from that. And then 
uh, with that, the cultural kinds of things that are there, the, the music, uh, the style, and, the, and there's a certain style of preaching that, that goes on and that sort of thing. And, and uh, while I didn't pick up all the traditions, I held those and some of those because I, I grew up Baptist, and so there's some Baptist in me that I, I can't shake. Uh, but at the same time, uh, understanding that the important thing is, boy, let, let's keep the focus on God as much as we can. Yeah, I, I think a lot of a lot of white guys don't understand that there's a wide variety of church expression in every culture, in the black black church culture, in the white True. church culture. Even though there are white Baptists and white Presbyterians and white Pentecostals, there's a wide variety of that in the in the black churches too. And I would label you as somewhat tame. Yes, yes. I can see why. I agree with that. I yeah. agree with that. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, now speak a little bit more broadly about the African American church culture. Um, when I say tame, you agree with that. But uh, maybe someone watching this video has never been to one of the local. Uh, African-American churches, or maybe they've only been to our church. They don't even know what tame and raucous would refer to. But So give us a little bit more a explanation of what worship looks like in the African-American church more broadly. Sure, we're, we're, we're pretty spirited. Uh, when I say spirited, uh, boy, we're, we're okay with, with the drums, the tambourines, in terms of the, 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 uh, the music worship and that sort of thing. And so we're pretty spirited there. And then uh, people can get loud, and so people get energetic and loud and emotional and that sort of thing. And a lot of preachers uh, preach from a certain level of emotion, certain parts of the, the message that they bring in that sort of thing. So uh, from a uh, cultural perspective uh, that that strong high level expression is is just part of what what happens there and people feel at home with that and there I've had, I've had people give me feedback if they don't see it they don't feel it they don't sense it uh, they haven't had church and so we get uh, we, we get that feedback and we see what people are ex looking for and experiencing there so to me uh, knowing that we're not to be people pleasers at the same time, we still want people to feel comfortable in God's house of worship. And so that's what In a lot of my church experience, worship is the thing that you do before the message starts. And worship is the music that someone on stage is doing some singing, or maybe a small group of people on stage are doing some singing. And the people in the congregation, depending on the church, um, are either singing along or they're watching. Yes. Um, sometimes it's special music that someone just watches. And sometimes it's congregational songs that someone's singing. Uh, in your church, when someone's up front doing some singing, what are the people out in the in the congregation doing? That brings to mind participation. We're looking for people to participate. Pe people are accustomed to participating with who's ever singing. And if a preacher's preaching, they're giving him amens, and you preach a brother, and those kinds of things. And so there's that participation uh, that we're accustomed to in our culture in terms of the congregation and what goes on in the church there. And uh, again, the emotion can come out because some people can get up and jump and dance and run the aisles in some churches and that sort of thing. So that participation Participation is kind of important to people. So worship for you includes um, celebration, it includes music, it includes um, spirited music, drums, um, <laughs> people dancing, people jumping up and down, maybe sometimes yelling an amen here or there or more. Yes. Um, but also throughout the message. Too. Yes. There's uh, participation all the way through the message. So worship for you means all those things, right? All those things. And uh, and I agree with, uh, with 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 your I understand your style of, of worship in terms of including the the whole life of people and so we teach that but I don't think we hold people as accountable as we could or should mm. in terms of that so uh, we continue to teach that but I've got I've, I've I grew up where pastors did some home visits like doctors did way back then. Mm -hmm. And so pastors been able to do home visits were in a position to uh, hold people a little bit more accountable in terms of their lifestyle. And so to me, uh, worship really should be a lifestyle and that's what I teach, but that's not what I hold people to in terms of what I know that's happened in the past. So let's get back to the Sunday morning experience. Uh, before 2020, a Sunday morning would look like a lot of people in a room, lots of singing, dancing around the room for some people, 
Uh, certainly not everybody is doing the dancing. That's right. Um, some people are clapping. Some people are sitting. That's I, right. There's all kinds of expression. But there's all a variety of participation. But that's all pre-2020. What did, it, what did it look like this last year <laughs> for you? What did worship look and feel like? Completely different. Completely different. Because we focus on live streaming. And so since we're focused on live streaming, uh, what we're doing right now is I and the praise team are the ones at the church building. In October, we came from the shut-in point of view to live stream at the church. And so instead of live streaming from my home and not having anybody else a part of the service, except for Tamitra, who, uh, who, uh, who would do a welcome for us on the live stream, and my deacon would send a written prayer that I would read during the live stream. Now he does it himself. I ask him to do a prayer for the service for live stream. Demetrius does the welcome, and I do a few announcements before we do uh, a communion. One of the things that we don't do that I'm looking forward to getting back to when I know that we're not going to get back to everything we did in 2019, but one of the things that we were doing in 2019 was uh, having a portion of the service where people would express thanksgiving. Mm. And so I wanted people to, hey, you come meet God at the door of Thanksgiving before we go into the courts with praise. And so we would give people a chance to tell us what you're thankful for, what things you're thankful for. And don't say, don't just stick to the material stuff. Give, give us some way God, how God is, is changing things in your life and that sort of thing. As so, part of the gathering, people would just, you'd ask them to stand up, give them the microphone, let them talk for a bit. Exactly. Exactly. So that's part of the gathering. That was part of the front end of the gathering too, because I picture people, once they do that, then they're a little bit more involved in worshiping yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of the worship. Uh, Sunday morning worship that goes on there too. But and then for a large portion of this year, it was just you and Tamitra recording from your house, sending out a video to the people? Actually, we didn't record. We did live stream. Okay. So we did live, live stream. But just the two of you? Just the two of us. Okay. Yeah, so we did that up until October. And then October, I asked the praise team to come to the church and sing praises at the church. Uh, and so we would have the praise team start off with the praises, sing those songs. And then uh, Deacon Carl, my deacon, would, would say a prayer. And uh, he would say a prayer, and his prayer, he works to be pretty comprehensive with his prayer and sort of thing. So that really seemed to be helpful. And then I give some announcements. And then, uh, then we still put some, uh, just again, traditionally, we still put emphasis on people giving from their hearts, giving the way God wants us to give. So that giving and offering to the church, strength, you know, supporting the local church, uh, we still put emphasis on that. And then uh, now another change, too, from 2019. In 2019, we serve communion every Sunday. Mm -hmm. But now we're doing it just once a month. And so we went back to the old Baptist tradition of doing it once a month. That's what we did. In How do you churches. do communion? Uh, we have the little packet, pre-packaged uh -huh. communion. And so... Do people uh, come to the church? Whoever comes to the church participates with okay. those who are at the church so me and the praise team and so and we haven't limited people so when we first got back and when we yeah when we first back in the building in October we had about 20 people the first Sunday about 15 people the next Sunday and the numbers continue to dwindle and now we're down to just a handful of people come once in a while and so everybody d does not come all the time mm -hmm. and so whoever's there we give them a packet, they join us. And uh, when I first start the service, I let people know, okay, this is Communion Sunday, get your cracker, get your juice, get something ready so that we can commune together. And so I still have them commune together even though we're live stream. Uh, from their homes? From their homes. Okay. So that sounds incredibly different from 2019. Incredibly Much different. less participatory. Um, it sounds like celebration might even be difficult. Um, Almost zero interaction with the preacher. Almost zero. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then my next question would be, what lessons have you learned through that? Um, over this last year, through 2020, um, what, what did you learn about worship as a result of this last year? Uh, one of the first things I learned about worship is, is boy, it, it pays for me to be flexible. I, I learned on that administrative job at Purdue, you got to be flexible because you have no idea what's coming uh, at you uh, per, per day with situations that you work with. And so I learned to be flexible and also uh, paying attention to the fact that this pandemic is causing people 
uh, to show themselves in terms of, well, exposing their commitment level. I'm thinking they're exposing their commitment level. And so now we see people with a higher commitment level who turn out to be the core people who are hanging with us, mm-hmm. even though we have a different look in terms of worship and different involvement level, different engagement and that sort of thing. And I think we're all thinking that at some point we're going to be back together again on the other side of the vaccine and that sort of thing. So we'll be able to do some things together. But until then, we got to do these things differently to keep people safe. And uh, and then not spread spread the gospel, but not spread the virus. And so we, we term it that way as well. But I see those differences. And I think uh, I know that we're not going to be back like we were in 2019. Uh, but in some respects, I think we're going to be a little bit more wise about what we need to be focused on. You said that one of the things you learned uh, in 2020 is that it exposes people's commitment level to the church. Um, one of the things that we use around here to talk about worship is putting God first in our lives. And um, commitment and putting God first in your life are closely related concepts. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. What have you learned this last year about what it means to put God first? I feel that I've learned that uh, putting God first in terms of, uh, and I look at this commitment level, if people are intentional about doing that, I look at myself first and I look at the fact that I have opportunity to spend more quality time with God, uh, prayer time in his word, p- applying as much as I can understand and what adjustments I need to make in that sort of thing. And so I want to lead my congregation to do the same thing. And as we do that as individuals, I see the fact that we'll have influence on our families. And then I look forward to the families to have influence on uh, the community and then within the church. And so uh, I'm looking at those four levels, individual, family, church, and community. And so looking at those levels, I want people to be operating from their true, strong relationship with God, being the blessing. Because my term is we are here to be a blessing to each other, one another, and let's, let's keep up the one another's that God intends for us to have. It's interesting. You were saying that this pandemic season has given you more opportunities to develop that close, that close relationship with God, more time to invest in his word and in prayer. And so in some respects, we should be looking at a church um, globally, or at least in this country, we should be looking at a church that is more deeply spiritual and more attuned with God than ever before. I agree. 2020 should have produced in us a very deeply worshipful people, a deeply uh, closely walking with God kind of people, spiritual people. Have you seen that? Uh, Not as prevalent as I would love to see it, but I'm seeing that it just kind of, I don't know, you know how there's that, there's that saying that some people have separating the boys from the men kind of Mm. thing. And I'm seeing that the people who seem to be serious and take God serious, they seem to stand out a little bit more. So some people you've seen go deeper yes. and take advantage of this. Yes. And other people you've seen, what have they done? I've, other people I've seen shy away, drop off, and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. I've got people, you know, people who were pretty active in coming to the building. But boy, when it came to being on live stream, uh, they took opportunity to, uh, to be absent absentees and so I'm seeing that and then uh, and then when asking people about uh, being committed or staying committed or what their commitment level and that sort of thing is uh, learning that uh, people feel comfortable uh, having that distance between between them and God Mm. and so that that bothers me uh, that they're comfortable with that because I'm thinking that God's not happy about that and they're going to suffer some consequences. So I'd like to be a part of helping them understand how they can do that and then be the blessing that God wants them to be and still do uh, some of the things that, that God allows them to be able to do. Now, for some of these people that you've seen, if, if God is no longer number one in their lives, if God is no longer at that top place in their lives, what have they put there? What have you seen in some of these conversations you've had or people in your church or people that you know what has become number one for them in this last year? For my observation, it's just life in general. Uh, 
hmm. life in general. People, I see people who they just kind of want to hang and do what they can do in terms of being, uh, what I would say, being an American in terms of I can go shopping, I can go vacation, I can go visit, those kinds of things. I want to keep uh, the eat, drink, and be merry sort of spirit mm. going. Time and so, for myself. Time for myself. And so, the, yeah, exactly. Th that would sound like selfishness <laughs> has taken the top spot. Yes, yes. That's exactly, that's exactly the way I termed it uh, from some situations that I saw where people who are uh, no longer interested in being a blessing to other people. Hmm. So in some respects, what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say is that in 2020, it's really revealed the commitment level of certain people and it's divided us. Some people have grown in their faith and gone, gotten stronger and more spiritual and more deeply connected to God directly. And other people mm -hmm. have just become more selfish and more, more in tune with their own desires and less motivated by the trappings of church, almost yes. as if we could see that their worship beforehand was for show and maybe not real. It, am I expressing it right, what, you, what you've seen? Yes, uh, I would have to say it in, in those terms because uh, people would come and they would uh, express their commitment to God in different ways, uh, but at the same time, we know that that was just in the church worship setting, and we don't know what was going on in life, the way I would put it, Monday through Saturday. Yeah. And, uh, and so... Uh, people turn out to, uh, I think the 2020 exposed that selfishness because that's basically what it turned out to be. I know one thing that's true in all cultures, even though it doesn't feel that way when you're looking at someone else's culture, is that in every culture, worship can be faked. Mm. And that um, the Sunday morning that you look around the room and you have 100 people in the room, that's not a guarantee that there are 100 people who are worshiping. That's true. Um, you could have 10 people in the room, and that's not a guarantee that 10 people are worshiping. Uh, worship is something that we tend to talk about as if it's this thing you can see and this thing that you do, mm. but um, it, that's easily faked. Yes. You know? yes. And, and right now, you're saying that over the last year, you've seen the authenticity bleed through. Yes. And whether someone has it or not. That's correct. So let me ask you then, um, hindsight and all that, if there's... If you could go back to James Foster in 2020 in March, okay, <laughs> and give him some advice on how he needs to pastor his church, um, what would you say to, to 2020 March James Foster? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is I would thank God because before 2020 March first came, I remembered in 2019 praying about what should I be focused on for 2020. And in 2019, long about October, November-ish, uh, prayer, the focus on prayer came to mind. And so I focus on prayer, and, uh, and, and, and March 1st comes, and I'm thinking, we're already praying, so let's keep the prayer going, and let's stay strongly focused on, on prayer in terms of our communication with God being our Heavenly Father and so forth, and, and that relationship. And so I was so thankful that that happened. And I think the thing that I would do different going back to March 1st, knowing what I know now, would be to be a little bit more forceful in teaching people to prepare themselves uh, to, to be, what, stronger in their relationship with God for anything that could happen, for whatever could happen. Because uh, to me, I, I had a little taste of military when I was in junior ROTC in high school. And so I remember the emphasis on, boy, the squad needs to know what's in the squad leader's mind about what the mission is. And that's so you don't withhold anything inf you know, informationally from your people. And so to me, I'm thinking, boy, I should... I, I would focus more on making sure people know that uh, the way God, well, God is, is letting us know that this world is not going to be the same years from now the way it is now before it comes to an end. Mm. And it, there could be a lot more challenges that people have to go through in that. So, so I would want to be more active in getting people more prepared for what's to come in terms of the end of times. Mm. So looking beyond just the hardship that people faced in 2020, oh, yes. but you're, you're saying you would, have, you would have wanted to prepare people more for the fact that 
in eternal perspective, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Exactly. And so if I, I'm thinking if I can get them ready for the eternal, with the eternal perspective, that would have them prepared for whatever is in between. If, if we had planned it well, we could have said, okay, 2020 is the year for us to practice the tribulation. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> because it's coming eventually in the it's future. It's coming eventually. It's coming eventually in the future. But, uh, exactly. Inter interesting question. Um, <laughs> so, so now let me ask you this. Um, looking forward, 2021 and beyond, um, what do you plan to do differently in 2021? Um, or are you just going to try to get back to 2019 as soon as possible? Not going to try to get back to 2019, <laughs> although <clears throat> definitely want to get back to some things we were doing in 2019, because uh, I think there's still some benefit uh, to the Thanksgiving and there's still some some benefits to, uh, uh, to to my focusing on helping people strengthen their own personal relationships with God so he can use them the way he wants to use them. And so I still want to be in that mode of preparing people and that sort of thing. So don't want to get completely back, but then want to use what I've learned in 2020 uh, for 2021 and beyond in terms of knowing now that uh, we just, since we don't know when our time is up, when God's going to call us home, then we really ought to count our days, count our blessings mm -hmm. and look, look forward to making sure each hour counts, each day counts, each year counts, each month counts in light of what we're doing for God. We're here for God. Keeping God first. That's the phrase he used. And so to me, that's those details in terms of keeping God first. And so in terms of keeping God first, what does that mean in terms of bringing uh, uh, the children along? What does that mean in terms of being able uh, to be a blessing to people who are not blessing you? What does that mean in terms of being so self-focused uh, that when you're mistreated, you allow Satan to distract you about the mistreatment rather than going forward for God. Mm. And so I want people to be able to go forward for God no matter what's going on. And you're still raising the, uh, the bloodstained banner, as we say, uh, in, in, in traditional church. And so I want people to, to be strong enough in their faith in God that they don't need me in front of them they have themselves and God and they're able to do what God has called them to do because they understand what he's called them to do. They're committed to what he's called them to do and they're working to do what he's called them to do. So that go part, I, we are def definitely agree with the go. Yeah. As, I don't know enough about history. I don't know as much as I should. But you mentioned earlier that one of the reasons uh, celebration is such an aspect of the Sunday morning worship experience in black churches is that uh, they have been freed from slavery by this God that they celebrate. And one of the things that I've uh, perceived is that I think um, the African Americans in the United States understand how to persevere under hardship greater than, uh, a, greater than I do, greater than a lot of uh, people who've been raised in a less oppressive kind of environment. Um, what does it feel like to you as the pastor of an African-American church or even just a pastor in general in this culture to see people who don't endure when faced with hardship? Uh, they're faced with the hardship of not being able to come to church and be with other people or whatever other kind of hardships they've faced this last year. What does it do to you as a pastor? Does it demoralize you? Does it discourage you? How do you deal with that when you see this person I thought who was committed has just revealed to me that they are not able to stand up under trial? Uh, it could possibly discourage me because, uh, again, 2020 brought out a lot of people who were so self-focused uh, that they just, they just can't take stuff, so to speak, the way I see it. And, and so that could possibly be discouraging, but the way I'm able to look at that, and, I'm, and I give God the credit, I'm able to see that this shows how much more we teachers of his word need to be able to be more effective at getting people to see what God has to offer. Hmm. So that given the choice between your wishes and God's wishes, 
we want them to understand that God's wishes are actually better. Oh my goodness, yes we do. Yeah. And so what we want to do is, is in, convince them to give God a chance. So you're maintaining hope. Yes, I'm maintaining. I'm the one who sees the glass half full. And so, <laughs> so I'm maintaining hope. But, and, and I think uh, and the way I see it is, since I'm alive, I've got hope. And so when my time is up, I don't know what mindset I'll be in, but well, I there'll do. be no need for hope. <laughs> no need for hope. Real. It'll, be, it'll be real. That's right. <laughs> then it's real. Yeah. Who hopes for what they already have? I yeah. Think that's somewhere. And so I'm always one who's thankful that I have today. I have this not this hour, this minute. And so I'm thankful that I have this. And so I'm asking myself, how can I make it count? I've learned to do that. I've learned to ask myself, how can I, what can I do to help make it count in terms of being a blessing? Because my phrase is, hey, let's be a blessing to somebody. Mm. So I just want to continue to set the example of being a blessing to someone. So let's get personal then just a little bit. 2020 hasn't been an easy year for you personally. Correct. Um, how, how has it affected you? What have you learned about yourself? And what um, hindsight, you know, looking back at this last year, what's different about you because of 2020? Uh, two things come to mind, two things. I, I lost two siblings to COVID uh, in 2020. Uh, Tamitra and I were close to losing our own lives in a car accident in 2020, head-on collision, and see that we could have been gone in an instant had that gone different than the way it went. And we came out with just scratches and bruises. And, and, uh, and so to me, God seems to be getting my attention about the fact that uh, there is a, there's an urgency that needs to be continued, developed, and, and, and focus on uh, for people to give God a chance, for people to believe in him. There's an urgency for me to do whatever I can to let people know believing in God is the right thing to do. We aren't guaranteed tomorrow. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. And that makes us urgent <laughs> to help other people realize that there's urgency in their lives exactly, too. Exactly, exactly. And, and I am appalled at the people who don't seem to be sensitive to these thousands of lives that are being lost by this virus mm. and the insensitive insensitivity that's showing up in just a little thing of not wanting to wear a mask, not wanting to do the social distancing and that selfishness overpowering those kinds of things. And so the lack of value of lives of other people I'm just, it's just, it's, it's kind of mind blowing for mm. me to see it is much more work that needs to be done to give, to get people to give God a chance. Yeah. John would say that how can you love God whom you've seen if you can't love the ones that you haven't, uh, God you haven't seen, exactly. how can you love the God that you haven't seen if you can't love the brother that you can see? Exactly. Um, this is how we know we love God and that we belong to him, <laughs> that we love one another. Exactly. I, I, I'm with you on that, that putting God first requires me to love my neighbor mm -hmm. because no, he loves them. Exactly. No matter what he looks like. Yeah. <laughs> or what he thinks he <laughs> what believes he thinks in. he or, believes in. Or, yeah. 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 We're so quick to focus on those differences. But boy, my goodness, if God made a person, that person is important enough to him, ought to be important enough to me. Jesus didn't ask me who I voted for before he died for me. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. So last question I have for you, James. Um, I know you don't know the people of Lafayette Community Church all that well. Uh, you've been here a couple times um, and they don't know you all that well, but we're believers. We're people who love Jesus, try to follow Jesus, and we're trying to follow him better today than we did yesterday. And so you at least know that much of the people that you're addressing on this video. I want, I want to invite you to share with us, based on 2020, what is the most important thing that you want people to know? The people who are watching this video, what is the most important thing on your heart that you would want to communicate to them with regard to putting God first in their lives, with regard to worship, or something else that God has laid on your heart? Uh, hindsight 2020 is behind us. 
moving forward, what is the most important thing you'd like to share with the people watching this? The most important thing I would share that I want to share <laughs> is putting God first needs to be done by us as individuals. When you put God first in your life, you're setting an example. When you put God first in your life, uh, we hear it in your words. We see it on your face. We see it in your actions. When you put God first, then we see that you're spending time with him. I'm still learning that Jesus spent lots of time praying to Father God in heaven. And so to me, that prayer time was a time that he would focus on, okay, what can I do today to be better focused on putting God first? And what can I, and to me, that then affects everything else, everything else. I'm, a, I'm looking forward to affect everything else about me in terms of times. It's easier for me to say no to some of the people who want to take my time for different things. And when I see that it doesn't fit the priority of God being first, that's kind of easier to say no to. And so putting God first really needs to be shining through in a lot of different ways. And so when it's when when and we're in a situation like 2020 and Jeff, if we talk, I'm thinking about uh, the challenges uh, that people have across barriers, mm -hmm. racial barriers, cultural barriers, whatever the barriers are. Uh, for me, putting God first means you're 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 lessening the view of the barrier. You're lessening the view of the differences and, and you're focusing more on the fact that we are human beings who God has an opportunity to work through us to be a blessing to other people. What else can we do together to make that happen? Well, James, I want to thank you so much for joining me, for participating in this. Sure thing. Um, I, I know you're an encouragement to me and you're, encouragement, you're an encouragement to the people who are part of our church and anyone who would be watching this video. So I want to thank Great. you again. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, Jeff. I want to thank you for joining us for this. Um, we are thoroughly excited. I'm thoroughly excited to be a part of a church community here in Lafayette that is not just us, but that as we begin to realize that our job is to put God first in this church and in our lives, we also recognize that that means embracing what God is doing in other people as well. And so if God is going to be working in us, I believe he's going to be working in others too, and so therefore we should be cooperating. I want to thank James, I want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank all of you for participating in this video. Um, I'm just so appreciative that we get to do this through technological means these days. <laughs>